this has been, if, if you guys haven't uh, noticed from some of the things I've said over the last few months, this has been a big deal for me because I know, I know how bad uh, people are struggling. I, I hear it. Uh, this week, I got several emails and even texts from people who, who were either a part of our church or watched the video that I did on Facebook wanting to tell me that they had made an attempt or two attempts or three attempts. And, and you have to ask yourself, because uh, if you've never been there, and, and I want to tell you something. Here's something you don't have to feel weird about, okay? Unless you're an exceptionally different person, there's not a person in this room that at one point hadn't thought, oh, the world might be better off if I was gone. I'm just telling you. We've all had those <laughs> thoughts. And it's interesting, uh, for every one death that happens, there are 25 attempts. So uh, the statistics we have say that 45,000 people in America take their own lives, and, and that doesn't seem like a whole lot as big as America is, but, but multiply that by 25, and then you multiply that by the people that think about it sometimes, and you multiply that by the people that sometimes are driving down the highway, and they think, you know, all I got to do is I just make a little turn and hit that, you know what I'm saying? But there's a difference in the ideation of and, and the actual attempt of, and, and, and so, so how do we go? Because, you know, as a human being, it's, that's not in our DNA. As a matter of fact, we're the only animal on the planet that would take our only, own lives. So, so what has to get us to the point where we do that? Well, it's a, it's a thought process. It's a process of taking the things we know and the experiences we have and, 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 and going forward and uh, to the point where we make that decision. And I'm going to show you some research today just uh, briefly without just bombing you down with a lot of material and stuff. But, 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 but I want you to remember this. If you're here at LCC today and you're here for the first time and, and you don't really know what we're all about, this is what we're all about. At Life Connection Church, we exist to lead people to love God and love people and change the world through Jesus Christ. Now, this, lots of people say change the world. People running for president says change the world. People running for any other kind of office says, you know, your teachers tell you to go out and change the world. But here's something I know. I promise you, here is something I know. If we get to the point in our life where we live God's truths, the ones we've grown up in church listening to and everything else, and it's not just a bunch of rules or laws for us, if we get to the point where we live those truths, it will be life-changing. And not just instantly, but every day, incrementally, as you go along and you, and you do the things that God wants you to do and you love Him and you worship Him with your life, it, it changes you. And, and today as we look at these, these um, thoughts of suicide, these painful thoughts, and then we're going to look at Robert McGee's four false beliefs and what you're going to see over the next few weeks, that if we replace those lies from the enemy... With God's truths, it will change you. I saw it as a counselor over and over and over again, and it's one of the things that God drove, used to drive me to become a pastor. About 45,000 Americans a year take their own lives. But it's not all mental illness. We hear people all the time when they write about suicide and they think, and we want to think it's mental illness because, because we don't think that a human being would make that kind of decision. But 54% of the people who take their own lives successfully, boy, that sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? 54% of them had no depression, no anxiety. Nobody could tell anything was different about them. They weren't thinking crazy things. They weren't hearing the TV talking to them. They weren't having anything like that happening to them in their lives. They just came to the point where they talked themselves into the fact that they were tired of this. They didn't want to take their lives, but they wanted to escape. They wanted to relieve the pain, the, the mental pain that they were struggling with. Now, experts agree that teaching people how to cope better, 
This is what I've been telling y'all for a little while. It bothers me. It bothers me that a person can be struggling mentally with everything from depressions to alcoholism to whatever. They can go to a counselor who's supposed to help him. And the counselor will say something like, that's just who you are. You're just going to have to learn to cope with it. You know, you're just going to have to learn to cope with it. No, you can change. You can change. If you're not the person that you feel and know that God wants you to be, and the only way you're going to know that is if you study and be with God and know what God wants you to be, if you're not that person, you can change. And, and it bothers me because people come to me all the time for referrals on counselors. It's really hard to find Christian counselors out there that will really teach you God's truths. But they'll change you. They'll change you. Negative thoughts of self-blame and condemnation and humiliation can lead a successful person to the point where they decide it's time to take their own life. I wanted to read to you just a little bit from this funeral that I did a, a few months ago. A young man, about 30 years old, who was successful. He had graduated college. He had his master's degree in business. He was out there trying to make it in the world. He just started his own financial company and nobody had a clue. And all of a sudden one day, they found him in his old bedroom at his parents' house on the other. You know what his note said? He wasn't. But he'd convinced himself in his head that he was. You can change that. Here's what I wrote. We're born with two needs that most people spend most of their lives trying to get met. The need to feel loved and the need to feel significant. We seek the approval of others to feel loved and we work to achieve at some higher level in order to feel significant, successful, happy. We have these needs because we have this God-sized void we are born with and the world holds love and significance out in front of us like a carrot on a stick. When we can't reach this self-determined level of feeling loved and successful, shame sets in. Shame tells us that we are who we are and we can't change. Loneliness and lowly feelings about ourselves become a backdrop to our lives. Hope can eventually become an unreachable dream or a wish. Now you might be thinking, why would a Christian struggle with this God-sized void? We talk about heaven a lot at funerals. Some of you this week, including myself, said something like, at least he's in a better place. It's the ultimate feeling. No more pain, no more stress, no more running for the carrot that always seems to be out of reach. This is so true. I think the biggest problem we have is that we look at heaven as our last stop. It's our last stop, and, and, it, but it, and it seems so far away, and, it's, and it doesn't seem very real. And, and when you talk about heaven to a person, it's to a person who's not a believer, that doesn't mean anything to them. If you say, hey, I'm a Christian because I want to go to heaven, heaven means nothing to them. It's, it's hard to hang on to that hope, and it's getting harder. Jesus made heaven a journey, not a final place. And that's what we're working on here. Heaven. We're not going to get close to heaven here, but we'll slowly be working our way toward that. Jesus said in Matthew 6, he says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Everything you need, not the ideals that you believe you should have. Now, it's interesting. Look at this. It's on your notes. Suicide rates are higher in places with a better quality of life, where individual freedoms are celebrated, in areas with better weather, among college students with better grades, and parents with higher expectations.
I remember back in the 80s, I think it was. Y'all remember the 80s, the suicides in Plano? Was it the 80s? If you weren't around here back then, uh, Plano was the happeningest, biggest, fastest growing, richest people and whatever, all the doctors and lawyers and neurosurgeons and all that other kind of stuff lived in Plano. And all of a sudden their teenage kids just started taking their lives just started taking their lives. And, and, and what we have to realize, uh, uh, being poor isn't, isn't a necessary risk for uh, suicide. But being successful at once and then becoming poor makes it a risk. Being alone, being alone is, I know people that love being alone. I, you know, I love sometimes going off and being alone, but being alone all the time or, or being single doesn't make you have a risk for suicide. But being married and believing you have a su successful marriage that you're going to have for the rest of your life, and then all of a sudden that marriage is gone, that puts you at risk. People make attempts. Like I said, they make attempts. And I really believe from what I know that a lot of times the attempts were just kind of, well, I'll just give this a shot. And they make an attempt and they don't take enough pills. They make an attempt and they don't cut themselves in the right place. They, they make an attempt and they don't run their car into the right bridge. They make an attempt and, and they live. And, and, and the, the people that struggle with that and, and with the pain of that, the more they make those attempts, the more down the road they go of talking themselves into being successful. People that do it successfully put the work in and they're ready. And that's why people will say things like, well, it was just, a, somebody was just telling me, a, a lady in the cubicle beside him just a, a, a month or so ago, uh, everybody thought she was the happiest lady on the planet. Found out the next morning she had taken her life. They started looking at her emails and everybody she talked to, she was acting like she was going to be there Monday. I'm going to be there Monday. I'm gonna, and she acted happy and, and enjoying life and all that other kind of stuff. And then, and then all of a sudden, and she had motives. A lot of the times when you read those notes and see those notes, the, the motives, uh, the, the motives are, are not even mentioned because they have something to do with taking care of my kids or life insurance policy or, or people being better off with me gone or whatever. But it's not... It's not the people in poor countries, the people that live in the poor neighborhoods, if they're not killing themselves, each other, they're not killing themselves. It's that loss that comes. Most suicidal people aren't even aware of their condition. Why? We're born with this need to feel loved and to have significance. It's natural. We're born needing love and needing purpose. And, and as parents, that's our main job as our parents is, a, is to teach kids to, to take care of themselves and, and that we're going to take care of them and that we love them and, and, and to help them be the best person they can possibly be. Now, when you read Scripture, especially as you read the New Testament, you, you see the Apostle Paul writing all the time that, that how important it is for us to live out the Word of God and, and how living out the Word of God changes us from the old way, the old selfish us to the new way in, in the life change. So I put Titus 3.3 um, Titus 3 on here. Look what he says. He says, once we too, he's, he's writing this to the, to, the, to the people here, and he says, once we too were foolish and disobedient. We were foolish because we're disobedient. We were misled and became slaves to many of the lusts and pleasure, pleasures. Now, when we're born with a need to feel love and a need to feel significance, and as we go toward that, that becomes our lust. That becomes the thing of pleasure that we believe we have to have to feel good about ourselves. And that's why you have a, a college student who does very well, and, and they come to a point where they have to start making this decision in their life, and then they really start struggling because they've been leading up to this this time of success and, and, and what am I going to do now? And, and as we are these people who are, it says farther here, our lives were full of evil. Say this with me. Envy and we hated each other. <laughs> now Facebook is making that look so real. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh my gosh. The hate. The hate. Dear Christian, your opinion should never be hate. 
And if your opinion is going to make somebody else hate you, don't give it. Because you will lose the opportunity to help them be changed by God's love. Because that's what our job is. That's, that's who we are. Often, I found as a as a, a counselor and a, I taught psychology uh, for a while adjunctly while I was a counselor. Often when we study people, we find that God's truths are relevant and important and important to live by. And, and it's interesting because like I said, I, I would be teaching psychology in, in, in a, at, a, at Dallas Baptist University and at North Lake College. And, and the, the kids at Dallas Baptist University, their parents did not want them taking psychology. Because of all the atheists and the agnostics that, that write psychology. And then the students would be amazed when I would go, here's what Freud said. Doesn't that sound like some of that what God said? Huh? Here's what so-and-so said. Doesn't that sound a whole lot what God says over here? Because guess what? God knows more about us than anybody. And when we study people, what we find out is, hmm, that's why I found out when I started applying people's, God's truths to people's lives, it would change them. It would change them. So I'm going to show you real quickly six steps to escape the self. And that's what this guy, Roy Bomeister, who isn't a Christian, he's a psychologist. He did this in the psychological review back in 1990. But this is six steps of what he would call the escape theory. The escape theory. Number one is this. Falling short of standards. We, 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 we have these standards that we create. And, and, and I'll just tell you, people that are more successful will create the standards more. There are people who, who uh, don't make as much, much money and don't have the opportunity to make any more money. And their, their life is just such and such. And that's just the way it is. And they're just going to deal with that. And you'll never see those people commit suicide. They're too busy trying to survive to commit suicide. But, but what happens is, is, is we set these standards, these, these things, and we do that by looking at other people and seeing how other people... Does anybody in here ever compare yourself to anyone? Huh? Come on, be honest. You all do. We all do. There are those people we just don't like. There are those um, people that we unfollow because we're jealous. You know, I don't want to see that guy's success coming up on my feed anymore. I'm not the one that does that. I'm just saying I know this many of them. <laughs> <laughs> Often we create, we create these unreasonable standards for our own personal happiness. And, and so when we have setbacks, they just knock the feet right out from underneath us. Knock it right out from underneath us. These suicidal thoughts ha happen often after events of failure and after that person had had previous successes. So first thing is this, this falling short of their standards. And again, this is uh, from the Christian perspective. Uh, we get this from McGee, and that's what we're going to be dealing with those over the next, over the next few weeks. Second is the at attribution to self, the attributing it to self, self-blame, condemnation, actual hating of self. When a person gets to where they're having these painful thoughts, they, they hate themselves. They, they hate the things that they've done. They hate that they can't do what they, they want to do. And, and they just think that they're just overall bad. It's this condemnation of themselves. A self-response to a, a negative turn of events. They'll self-demonize themselves. I'm just so awful. The world would be so much better without me. The negative beating brings on feelings of worthlessness and shame and guilt and inadequacy and, and feeling that people think that way about us. So we start staying away from people and, and there's no hope for change. Thirdly, is a high self-awareness. Ceaseless and unforgiving, unforgiving com, uh, comparison with the preferred self, not just with other people. When you get to the point where you're going, I should be this way and I'm not. 
that's when the, this, this high level of self-awareness will take us down that dark street of those terrible thoughts that we have. Why can't I be like that? I'll never be that way. We, we'll blame it on our parents. We'll blame it on life. We'll blame it on others. But then the bottom line is, is we just hate ourselves because of who we are. And then number four, you develop into this negative affect. And affect means emotions. It's a constant feeling of, some of y'all know people. Some of y'all know people that can look at anything and say something negative. Look at those mountains. I wish that snow wasn't up there. That'd be so, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just like, give me a break. You're looking at mountains. But, but people do that, and, and that, that's what they have on themselves. And it, and it raises their negative emotions, which include anxiety and self-blame and, and, and socially disconnect themselves. Now, like I said, these people can be going along doing their life and, and going out with their friends and doing everything else. And, and people just think that everything is okay. They don't talk to their parents about it at all. They just learn because it's their problem. It's, it's it's, it's an attitude that they've got to fix themselves. And they have this intense anxiety that causes problems. And then number five, you ready? You wonder, how can a person get to where they would take their own life? I've heard people just... You know, I've dealt a lot with people who've been around people who have family members. And, and what I hear from them is how angry they are. They, they'll call them cowards. They'll, they'll, it, it's like, but this, this cognitive deconstruction, they, they break life down. And, and they're ashamed of the things that have happened in the past. And they're afraid of the things that are going to happen in the future. So their life becomes just now. And this now, which is a terrible time, it just stays here and it's never going to leave. There's no hope for me to go forward and I surely don't want to think about the past. So they just break things down. They break things down very simply. Uh, I was reading a, a guy that was reading these suicide. If, if somebody writes a, a flowery suicide note uh, and, and, uh, uh, and thinks at a higher level as they write this note and you go, whoa, what a beautiful written suicide note. That person wasn't to this place. And a lot of those people that, unfortunately, there are a lot of people that accidentally kill themselves. That accidentally. But these kind of people will, in their note, it'll say, sorry, I'm leaving. Don't forget to feed the dog. It's about now. It's about now. And they're not thinking. They're not thinking about, no matter who around them loves them, they're not thinking about those people at all. They, they've, they've used their brain to check out. Now, the brain is powerful. Let me give you an example of the brain being powerful. I was counseling a lady one time who had been uh, sexually abused all of her all of her childhood, all of her teenage years, uh, several of her first relationships with men were, were very abusive relationships. And now she was a, a practicing Christian who'd married a practicing Christian man. And um, she was still having lots and lots of struggles with all that abuse, by the way, which, which is a risk factor. It is a risk factor, that kind of abuse. And... Uh, and I asked her one time, because she was talking about how awful it was to uh, have a, uh, say this in church, have an in-bed relationship with her husband, and, but she would. And I said, well, well, tell me, how does that work for you? This is no lie. She says, I lay down. We get ready. And as we begin, I go up into the light bulb. Your brain has the power to do that. She goes up in the light bulb and watches what's going on down in the bed. Painful. Terribly painful. But the brain can come to the point where it will completely override what's in your DNA. Have you ever watched people and gone... How did he survive that? How did she survive that? We are built for that. 
We're built to survive. We're built to change. You know, we're, we're built to live in Texas where it's 100 degrees until November. We're, we're built to be those kind of people. But so when we come to the point where we're taking our own lives, they've, they've made these, these deep changes uh, in their brain to be able to get themselves to wherever to do that. And I'm going to give you just some short introduction on what we're going to be dealing about in the next few weeks. The four false beliefs that, uh, that Robert McGee writes about. I would recommend this book. Next to the Bible, I've recommended this book more to anybody than anything. Uh, at the beginning of the book, it talks all about it, and then he actually has a workbook at the end. But if you struggle at all with, with uh, feeling significant or depression or anxiety, or you just about struggle with anything, and you want to replace the false uh, beliefs that the devil gives you with the truths of God, this book is for you and you can get it on Amazon. Number one, here are the four false beliefs. You'll recognize these. Uh, probably next week I'm going to bring, a, I'm going to make copies of the little test that he has in his book with the four false beliefs so you can actually take that sitting there and, and find out how much these false beliefs affect your life. The first one is this, I must meet certain standards in order to feel good about myself. Now, now, as you can imagine, that can cause a whole lot of problems in your life. And, and that's the kind of false belief that will take you down. But, but that's also the, the type of false belief that you can change by replacing with God's truth, by realizing who you are in God's eyes. But this kind of will give you the fear of failure and give you anger and resentment and, and depression and, and all that. Number two, I must be approved by certain others to feel good about myself. How many of you in here are people pleasers? Come on. I know I got brothers and sisters in here. Now, it ain't as bad as it used to be for me. In high school, I was a terrible people pleaser. I'd have done just about anything to get somebody to think I was cool or popular or, or whatever. But, but I still get that, man, when I get some criticism from somebody or somebody that doesn't like me or, or I do, it, I, it just, you know, that's what, and, 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 and it, can, it can really mess with you. And it can, and it can, give you fear of rejection and, and a constant attempt to please other people at whatever cost and you want to get run down quickly, that will do it. And, and by the way, women more openly suffer with that, but I know a lot of men that do as well. Although most men uh, struggle with the, uh, the need to, to meet standards uh, professionally or successfully. Number three, false belief. Those who fail, including myself, are unworthy of love and deserve to be punished. Can you see that taking you down a wrong path? It's, it's called the blame game. And, and it's not just about blaming a, and other people. It's, it's, man, what a sorry human being I am. I just can't believe that I would do that. Why do I keep doing that? And, and you can get to the point where you can just become a sorry human being because you're just constantly telling yourself what a terrible person you are. And the number four false belief is I am what I am and I cannot change. I am hopeless. And you've heard me say this before, this word right here is what gets you. If you give to the point where there's no hope, then what are you going to do? If there's no hope, you've either got to decide to stop fighting, keep fighting a battle that you think you're never going to win, or end it, unless you receive and understand the truths of God's Word. Let's go back to this Titus passage. He says, our lives are full of evil and envy and, and hatred of each other. And look at, look at verse 4 and 5. But when God our Savior revealed His kindness and love, He saved us. Now here's, here's what I hope you've, getting over the, you've gotten over the years from me talking about God's love for us. And you, you, you've got to realize our self-worth is not based on our performance or other people's approval. Our self-worth is this. Can I just give you something right now that'll make you, if you understand this, you're, you, it'll, it'll, God so loved the world he gave his only son. For you. For you. No, no, no. No, seriously, you. It doesn't matter how sorry you've been. It doesn't matter, matter what kind of a family you grew up in. It doesn't matter how many drinks you've had or how many wives you've had or, or, or anything else, any bullying that you did, you know? I, this, this stuff that's going on with the, uh, the judge and all that. Dude, if people brought up pictures of all the stuff that I did or said in high school... 
but God still sent Jesus for me. And it changed me. And it's changed you. And some of you in here need that to change you. It's not because of the righteous things that we've done, but because of his mercy. It's because of his mercy. Next part. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new, and a new life through the Holy Spirit. Here's, I left a blank for you. I know y'all love blanks. Remember, the world system is... Performance plus approval is how we get our self-worth. God's system is God's truth about put your name in there. In the next few weeks, you're going to specifically, I'm going to give you stuff that you have a good reason to write in there about who you are. Now, I'm about to show you a verse that I think is often misquoted. Uh, well, it's, it's often just used as a salvation verse. And it's John 8, 32. John 8, 32 says, And you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. It'll set you free from those false beliefs. The truth will set you free. Yes, the truth that Jesus Christ died for us. And if you're sitting in here today, and you've never made that commitment to follow Jesus Christ, you're, it's your move. God's already made it. Jesus Christ came and he died for you. Why? We have to come to a point where we admit that we need God. We admit that we need God, that we believe and trust in Jesus Christ, and we confess and commit to living for him for the rest of our lives. And if we do that, this is just the basics. This is the basics of that change. And then once you make that commitment and you decide to go forward, and maybe you need to be baptized next, then you start going forward and doing the things that God wants you to do. What's going to happen is, is those false beliefs, which all of us work off of on one part or the other, when, when I'm having a bad time, when, when I'm down, when I'm stressed, when I'm feeling down, man, I fall back into that lie. But when I'm good with God, I'm good with whatever. Whatever.